Um, I'll uh, attempt to step in for my colleague, Heather, um, who's experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, so bear with us. Um, this is our standard FDA disclaimer. Um, <clears throat> uh, if you have something you disagree, blame us, not our agency, is the standard one. Um, we have some slides that will talk about electronic submissions to CEDAR, ECTD requirements, study data requirements, and addressing the most common reasons for errors. Um, so electronic submissions to CEDAR. Um, where's the main one? Uh, electronic submissions to CEDAR are expected to conform to the FDA standards catalog. And there's a link to that. Uh, there's section 745 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. It requires these um, submissions to be submitted electronically. Um, you may have seen pictures of where a semi-load of documents used to back up to FDA loading docks. That's no longer the case. Everything's supposed to be electronic um, with a few very rare exceptions. Um, so submissions to NDA, BLA, um, ah, Let's see, um, and other files must be in ECTD format. Um, and we're attempting to figure out a few um, technical issues right now. Let's see, um, I'll see if my colleague Heather can take over and tell me to uh, forward on. Hi, Heather. Hi. Hi, sorry about that. I all of a sudden had some technical issues when I tried to talk. Um, okay, so um, I guess I can jump in and continue the slides. So thank you for that, Paul. Um, you did an excellent job from what I was hearing. Uh, Yes, so is there, can we put these into presentation mode or make them a little bigger? Is that possible? Sorry. Thank you so much. Yes, so, um, yeah, so I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, requirements around electronic submissions, uh, not just for study data, but for ECTD, and how R ties into um, these standards and these submissions. So a brief background on the requirements for the standards, which you can find all the standards listed in the FDA data standards catalog. Uh, the requirements are coming from a guidance known as the 745A guidance, uh, and from that branches two guidances known as the ECTD guidance and the study data guidance, which uh, spell out in more detail specific requirements around these standardized formats. And this applies to only certain submission types uh, however, it is recommended for the ones that are not required. Um, can we go to the next slide? Or can I advance them? I'm not sure. Thanks. So with the um, introduction of these guidances and uh, the electronic standards becoming more common. I wanted to give a brief snapshot. This actually focuses on ECTD submission standards, uh, but I wanted to give this overall picture of how many submissions CEDAR has been receiving and how many of those have become uh, 
over time submitted in the standardized format. So that yellow line going across these bars is the percentage of submissions we receive in ECTD format. And with that standardization of the application as a whole, with having modules and documents placed in specific areas, uh, FDA can utilize tools to extract data and metadata that's coming in uh, from the application and use tools to view and compare uh, applications. It becomes increasingly important that the study data within the application also be standardized so that way uh, tools can be used to extract, compare, and analyze this data as well. And by data, I'm thinking, I'm talking about uh, data in the larger sense, not just study data. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Thanks. So this uh, walks through a high-level look at the study data guidance and where you can find more information on them. But in short, in for uh, studies that start uh, in, after December 17, 2016 or 2017, depending on your application type, uh, CDISC data standards are required for these studies, whether it be SDTM, SEND, or ADAM. And generally, uh, study data sets should be submitted in the .xpt format. Next slide. So this is a look at ECTD and how the application is structured and how specific files fit into the overall application. So ECTD breaks out an application into modules. And I'm going to focus on module four, which houses non-clinical studies and module five, which houses clinical studies. Uh, so we pulled out a couple examples of the standardized headings in module four. You can see toxicology for uh, module four and biopharmaceutical studies for module five. Uh, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, these sections and know that there are many more standardized headings than what are being shown here. Tying into this is a document known as the file format specification that is available on the FDA ECTD webpage. And in that specification, it specifically calls out R and how we recommend are be submitted within an application today. Uh, and you can see here, it's um, specifically recommended for modeling and simulation files. And we uh, specify that uh, by module of where we recommend it be submitted. So there may be some studies in module three, which is why we include that, but module four and module five are uh, what is currently listed on the specification. Uh, this is a good reference guide to a little bit more uh, from technical recommendations for study data, ECTD, and some of our new ECTD validations that focus specifically on study. Next slide. So I want to walk through those new validations. And for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to go through, um, focus specifically on these new ECTD validations that look at studies and walk through um, the most common error we see and how R can play into um, helping to meet the expectations around these validations. So the first one is 1789, and this is actually a little separate from the other three validations in that it's based in the ECTD standard. 
Uh, it applies to different subsections of Module 4, Module 5, uh, and it is not based on the study start date. And it's looking for a, any file in a study to be referenced in a study tagging file, which is part of the ECTD standard. Uh, next slide. And then these are getting into 1734, 1735, and 1736, which really only apply to specific subsections of Module 4 and Module 5, which are listed here. And these are, um, there's a whole document that lists the expectations for CEDAR and CBER around study start date, application type, and these specific validations. So I recommend you take a look at that if you are not familiar. Um, but 1734 is looking for a data set named XPT, TS.XPT, with information on the study start date. 1735 is looking for file tags to be appropriately used for data sets and defined files. And 1736 is looking for uh, some specific files or some specific data sets and define.xml files depending on the type of standard data being submitted. And all of these became effective on September 15th, 2021. So they've been effective for about a month and a half now. Uh, next slide. Ah, uh, yes. And the uh, number one rejection reason we were seeing in the first month of these being effective is from 1734 errors. So that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the presentation. Next slide. So the causes of 1734 errors. There are a couple reasons that a 1734 error could be produced. However, the number one reason is a missing trial summary data set where the validation would expect to find one. Um, can you click through some of the animations? I think there's one more or two more. There should be, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so as you can see from, we did an analysis of the rejection notifications that went out around the first month and 58% of the 1734 errors were around a missing TS file. Uh, next slide. And this is where R can come in to help meet the expectations around these uh, validations and help avoid uh, having high severity errors that can lead to rejections of the submission. So uh, FDA has published a simplified TS creation guide and it talks about uh, how R can be used as well as Python to create uh, what's known as a simplified TS file. Next slide. Uh, and I believe there are a couple animations on this slide to click through. So within the document, it gives code to create this file in R and then to plug in uh, the important information, like is this a clinical or non-clinical study? What is your study start date? And then how to save so that way this file can be included in your study for your submission. Yeah. Also available, there is a Fuse utility that creates this, um, this file for you if you plug in a couple. And I believe this is built on the Shiny platform. Um, but this is also available for use and can also uh, create this file that would help uh, mitigate these errors. So um, that is where R can come into play to help avoid this error in future submissions to help meet the expectations around this validation. Uh, next, yeah. And now I turn it over to Paul.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Let's see, this will take a moment. Let me switch my setup. Yikes. Okay. Um, please bear with me a moment while I get a few things situated. Oh dear. Um, let's see. Okay. The uh, screens tend to go a little wonky on us when we switch modes. Very well. So um, Heather's talked a bit about how do you get data into the ECTD. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is what happens next? As statisticians, we tend to be focused on our areas of concern, but there's actually a whole list of things that come into play. So I thought I'd walk through some of these standard steps. Um, and again, if you don't like what I say, blame me, not the agency. Um, so what happens when a submission package is delivered to CEDAR? Um, is when the everything gets through the ECTD gateway, the clock starts ticking. Uh, we have two types of clocks, as it were. We have a standard review and a priority review. Um, this link does go to an FDA website where you can see some of the various options that would cause something to be a priority or six month review. Um, fast track is a process, breakthrough therapies and accelerated approval. Um, these are used extensively in certain areas and not so much in others. I think almost every oncology product, for example, has fit into one of these categories. Um, we do have some major steps that we have to walk through. Um, this is actually taken from a um, FDA document <clears throat> that sort of outlines the basic review process and various deadlines. One thing to note is that priority reviews have compressed review timelines. Um, so this helps with that. Um, we are switching to a, an integrated review template. What this means is that basically instead of each discipline writing up its own report and then hashing it out um, later on in the meeting process, we're supposed to be working together consistently and we can put our own concerns um, into a discipline specific appendice. So certain aspects um, will be looked at. There is a new role being created for a so-called clinical data scientist who's primarily working with clinicians to um, focus on safety data analysis. Uh, let me see if I can shut down my colleague. Um, um, okay, so. <clears throat> so, um, as Heather alluded to, um, submissions submitted or begun after a certain date are required to conform to CETA standards. We think normally for RN on SDTM and Adam, but um, SEND is also included as um, Kevin talked about previously, my, uh, Kevin Schneider, my colleague from FDA. Other centers, CDRH, CTP, CVM, and CIFSAN have different procedures and processes, um, which uh, was briefly touched on yesterday um, by one of our colleagues from Devices. The Study Data Technical Conformance Guide also additionally lays out technical expectations in addition to those um, we get from CDESC. 
So who uses this data? I'm focusing on NDA BLA data in this case. Of course, the Office of Biostatistics, where I reside, um, uses it, but others do as well. Office of Clinical Pharmacology, Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, Office of New Drugs, um, Scientific Investigations also uses BIMO data that's submitted. Um, the Office of Computational Sciences um, helps process some of the data. And the Office of Study Integrity and Surveillance gets called in in certain cases. So once things get through the basic um, gateway check procedures for errors, we can also look at further conformance to CETA standards through um, essentially uh, Pinnacle 21 applications. Um, Elena mentioned that we do have a Clue Points uh, CRADA, Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, for which I'm the PI, and that focuses on data anomaly detect detection and data quality assessments. Uh, we also have basically those tests that individual reviewers apply. And part of those focus on some of the format completeness issues, missing data, outliers, other types of issues. Part of this in the early process is to help identify sites for inspection. Pretty much by our initial filing meeting, we have to have some level of um, identification. So a filing meeting occurs either at day 30 or day 45, uh, depending on the type of the review. Basically, can the review proceed is one of the, the basic question. In addition to that, um, generally speaking, if we have overseas sites, we pretty much have to have an idea of which sites we need to inspect for um, potential problems. Oops. Okay. Um, one of the things that can happen if things are not found to be correct is complex significant deficiencies that cannot be corrected before filing uh, may result in refusal to file. Um, there's a whole list of things. Um, I have a at the bottom of the page a, a reference to a guidance from 2017. Um, one of the aspects that Heather touched upon is that required content, um, if it's not submitted electronically, can be um, actionable and to refuse to file, which means we won't consider it further. Um, assuming that it has been fi filed and is considered fileable and we can proceed to the next step, we can start then to talk about analyses. So one of the questions we'd like to ask is, can the sponsor's results be independently replicated based on the stated protocol and statistical analysis plan? Usually we don't start from completely from scratch. We tend to use the atom or analysis data sets to help out so we're not doing the heavy lift. But um, it can be surprisingly challenging to carry out what might be thought of as the sponsor's stated protocol and independently navigate this. Uh, one of the issues we can have is what um, has been referred to as the garden of diverging paths. Uh, so specific choices can make a difference. Uh, we also look at other analyses, um, potentially including sensitivity and safety. We do ask as part of that help to navigate that garden of diverging paths um, are the software programs that are used to uh, create and generate um, tables and figures. So uh, part of this is we do ask that these um, sponsor submit software programs in um, certain formats. Um, please do not submit binaries, um, for example. And if you want to see more, there is you can click on the link that's available and see that when the slides are distributed. 
Um, okay, so this is my favorite statement. Uh, this is still relevant um, six years after we came up with it. Um, FDA does not require use of any specific statistical software for, um, excuse me, for any specific software for statistical analyses. And it's not actually required as part of um, 21 CFR Part 11. However, uh, packages should be fully documented in the submission. And we quote the E9 principles that have been um, quoted elsewhere in this meeting. Um, sponsors are encouraged to consult with FDA review teams and especially with FDA statisticians regarding the choice and su suitability of statistical software packages at an early stage in the product development process. So if we have questions, perhaps even before the actual submission um, comes in can be helpful. One thing that FDA can do in the part of the submission process is an information request. Um, an IR letter is a letter sent to an applicant during the application review for further information or clarification. Um, these do not stop the clock that is ticking. So um, we do ask that folks respond to them as quickly as is reasonably possible. Um, we have a number of internal meetings um, that are now called joint assessment meetings as part of the integrated review process. Um, Part of it is to identify review issues and deficiencies that occur. And then later on, many of them are actually devoted to labeling. What's going to go hap what is going to be put on a drug label or submitted as part of a drug snapshot. And of course, we have a mid-cycle meeting. Usually the mid-cycle meeting um, involves some input from sponsors. Um, so there's, further discussion here. Um, rather than read through everything, let me just hit sort of the highlights. If there is a need to go to an advisory committee, this discussion begins fairly early on. Um, we also have, I should explain a few of our three letter acronyms. A PMR is a post-marketing request. A PMC is a post-marketing commitment. So what's going to happen after approval? Um, and a REMS is a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, I believe. Um, so how is the sponsor going to handle potential complications, adverse event types, um, issues and problems that need to be addressed uh, post-market? Advisory committees, um, as many of you are aware, um, we do use advisory committees to provide independent advice and recommendation. Um, those have been particularly relevant, um, some may have seen during the COVID um, vaccine evaluation, although those are CBER rather than CEDAR um, advisory committees. So, um, the advisory committee can vote and make a recommendation. Um, FDA generally um, values that and will abide by those decisions, but that's not universally true. The final decisions are made by FDA. Um, something that can happen later in the review process is a so-called complete response. And essentially this is a, what we might call a um, failure to approve. Um, so a complete response letter does it reflect a review of the data. Um, and if there's anything that we haven't reviewed, it will be noted, inadequate data. Um, so even if we think the data might have been good enough 
at one point to appear to be fileable. Um, if we find afterwards, um, we can issue a complete response early on in the process. Um, emergency use authorization. People have heard a lot of that these days. Uh, so this is part of um, the process. This was actually the um, after 9-11, some of the um, rules were updated and rewritten to allow for emergency use during a potential bioterrorism threat or a pandemic, which turned out to have been uh, farsighted in retrospect. So during a public health emergency, the FDA can use its emergency use authorization authority to allow the use of unapproved medical products or unapproved uses of approved products to diagnose, treat, or prevent serious or life-threatening disease when certain criteria are met. So initially vaccines, for example, were approved under emergency use authority. Some of the treatments for um, COVID were approved under emergency use authority. Um, and of course, right now we are in the midst of a public health emergency that is continuing. Um, speaking of that, we do have um, a number of different guidances that have been developed um, that are relevant. Um, if you click on this link, this will take you to, um, let me see. Here, this particular link will take you to, I think there's on the order of 130 different guidances that deal with different parts of the process and how COVID has affected practices. Um, something that perhaps we can point out that have already been um, seen um, with some of our lessons is that there's a utility of master protocols and platform trials. Um, the value of large pragmatic trials, particularly early on to screen some potential treatments, and something that folks are finding out as we continue to conduct business under these altered circumstances is the value of decentralized clinical trials. Ah, so I've gone one minute over. Um, I guess the next part is the questions and comments phase. Um, and I think you can enter your questions and comments through the um, chat windows. And um, I guess we're only seeing the backstage. So um, have you seen any questions or comments, Elena, that you can relay? Yes, I can see one here. Uh, do we need to provide any special documentation if the outputs are produced in programming languages, a language other than SAS? Um, having a code that's used um, and version and build so can be helpful. For R, I think it would be helpful to not only include the R version, but the package versions as well. Um, at least that's been my experience. It can be challenging to replicate something if you don't have the complete trail to work from. Okay. I cannot see any other questions, but it may be that I, hold on. Um, trail to work from. I cannot see any other questions, but it may be that I... Uh, I think Eric was forwarding some. Let's see. Let me read the question. Are there any recommendations on submitting English language expertise trail. that contain non-ASCII UTF characters, since 
Um, XPT do not carry encoding information. Uh, I think Eric was forwarding some. Of I think we have a little bit of a feedback loop, but um, anyway. Um, so let's see. Um, I think and this may be an evolving landscape. I think we're still dealing with some areas. Um, as far as I know, um, some of our SAS installations still have problems, for example, doing Unicode versus ASCII. So it's simplest if we have ASCII, if that's possible. Um, we may need to reach out and work on some additional cases, and that can be something that we handle over time. Um, let's see, I see another instance is, what is the FDA stance on submitting Shiny apps? Submitting the Shiny code may be challenging due to different versions, packages, et cetera. Thoughts? Um, let's see. Um, feel free to jump in at any time, Heather, if you need to. Um, but uh, I think for Shiny, the problem, as it's been noted, is there are a number of a whole constellation of different packages that would need to be submitted. Um, at one time, we were discussing the possibility of using containers. Um, I think that's still a worthwhile discussion, but I, um, there have been changes in the way we access containers. For example, Docker has changed the way um, licensing goes forward. And quite honestly, there's enough complications there that we're not there yet. Um, in limited cases, um, we've been able to attempt to accommodate some needs um, of folks using a Shiny app. Um, and that's pretty much on a one on an individual basis. It tends to be somewhat challenging to get all of that through the gateway right now. I think is probably the best way of saying it. So um, it's possible. It's probably merits further discussion. Yeah, from a uh, purely looking at uh, the submission coming in perspective, uh, we always recommend following the file format spec that I linked to in my slide um, to for what file types mm -hmm. uh, should be submitted within your application. So, so yeah, and I, I think part of the point is that they're having is that even if we have the right file types, it's getting the right version and linking up everything. So at a minimum, I think documentation of which version, even subversions. I've had programs run in R 4.05 that did not run in R 4.04. Um, so these are some of the types of things that uh, would be helpful that sponsors include. Um, let's see, I think we'll call that um, Don, do you think that the use of open source packages in, future, in the future could impact the needs for sponsors to submit software programs? Uh, readable code. Um, I guess I'm thinking for me, what I'm really looking at this is the closest I can think of that is the R markdown. And I think we do currently accept markdown in certain contexts. So I think we're kind of easing there incrementally. Um, I will wholeheartedly agree with a comment that I see from Eric, which is package management is critical. And um, he gives a link to the RENV 
for example. And I completely and totally agree with that comment. Uh, package management is critical, version control, all of those what might be called good software pack um, software management practices are truly critical if you need to turn the product that's been developed to some, over to someone else and have it have them run it on their system. Are there any plans to move on from XPT format to something more modern that is better supported from other software? Um, Hmm. Um, I've, I've heard various discussions over the last 10 years. I even, um, as Heather can attest, um, said we may be asked this very question. I don't know that we have a great answer at this time. Um, are you aware of any developments, Heather? Uh, I have not heard anything, um, so I, I would not know how to answer this. I know of at least two attempts to pilot a alternative and essentially my understanding is these they both were unsatisfactory um so i think the only consensus that i know of is that xpt is flawed um there are problems with it um but we need to figure out a better chance. Um, initially, part of the problem was um, other versions of transport files were not publicly released. So there's a whole history. Um, this is probably not the best place to discuss that. Um, it continues to be an issue. I think it's worth discussing, um, but I don't think there's um, immediate efforts in the work to address an effort to previous efforts did not succeed. Um, one more question. Okay, I think we do okay. not have more time for questions, but we're going to take a 10-minute break. Thank you.